Hey sightseers, Sightseeing Sally here. I'm with Marty. He's currently in the truck right now having lunch. Today we're checking out an old historic mining town here in New Mexico called Hillsboro. Now if you watched my last video on Lake Valley, you know that I mentioned Hillsboro in there. Hillsboro, unlike Lake Valley, got its start due to gold. In April 1877, gold was discovered by a couple of prospectors in the nearby mountains along Perchick Creek. Mines such as the Opportunity and Ready Pay quickly drew others to the area. Within months, a tent city sprung up. By December, the town was officially named, supposedly through a random drawing out of a hat. And the other thing that's notable about Hillsboro that, unlike Lake Valley, Hillsboro managed to survive. Yes, believe it or not, there are still people that call Hillsboro home. From what I understand, there's roughly about 100 people living here, which I find interesting given the fate of Lake Valley. But we'll get into that a little bit more later about why Hillsboro was able to hang on and is continuing to thrive in this day and age. First, we're gonna look at some old historic buildings such as the one in front of me here, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. Known as the Historic Miller House, this was built in the late 1800s using bricks made of slag. Slag, can you imagine how heavy one of those bricks is? If you think about it, that's a really interesting choice of material. It does give it a rather rainbowy kind of hue to the brick. And besides looking pretty, I imagine it makes your dwelling rather indestructible. And then just down the street a little ways, you have the ruins of the old courthouse and jail site. Now, I had read an interesting story online about the old courthouse, which, after talking with one of the locals, proves to be probably more fiction than fact. But I thought, why not share it with you? Because, you know, we always like to hear interesting stories, legends and lore, as we're going about these explorations. If nothing else, they give a little bit of a flavor as to the culture for storytelling in these parts. If you didn't know, at one time, Hillsboro was the county seat. And this would have been the county courthouse. Then in 1936, Hillsboro lost the county seat to what was then called Hot Springs, which is now known as Truth or Consequences. Now here's where the story goes where the lines blur between fact and fiction. According to the story, the citizens of Hillsboro were so upset by that decision that they traveled to Hot Springs to bring back all the county records. In retaliation, the people of Hot Springs came here and started dismantling the courthouse brick by brick. All that was left was a pile of rubble. Fascinating story, but you want to know the real truth? After Hillsboro lost the county seat, it was contested, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, where it was ruled that it should stay in Hot Springs. Then, because of that, they decided to tear down the courthouse and they auctioned off bits and pieces of it, one by one. Maybe the truth isn't quite as fantastical as the legend, but certainly proves how strongly the people here felt about keeping the county seat. Then next door to the courthouse are the remains of the old county jail. If we look over the ruins, we can see the old metal bars on the windows and the old door still standing, but really not much else. It's my understanding that this, the courthouse and the jail, were the location of some famous murder trial. I believe it's called the Fountain Murder Trial. The Fountain Murder Trial and the subsequent not guilty verdicts of the accused is still the subject of speculation and mystery, even to this day. 
from what I know, a guy by the name of Oliver Lee was accused of causing the disappearance of a judge, Judge Albert Fountain, and his son. According to historical accounts, Fountain and his eight-year-old son, Henry, were on their way home from the county courthouse in Lincoln, where Fountain had just successfully seen to the indictment of several men suspected of being involved in cattle rustling, including acquitted murder suspect Oliver Lee. Near White Sands, Fountain and his son disappeared, with only a telltale blood spot, a bloody handkerchief, and their carriage abandoned some 12 miles into the dunes, all that being left of them. To this day, no bodies have been found, and questions remain as to what really happened. A lot of history here. Stuff you wouldn't really ordinarily think would be part of a small town here in New Mexico. Speaking of history, what's now the Black Range Museum, run by the Hillsboro Historical Society, used to be the Ocean Grove Hotel, run by none other than the infamous Sadie Orchard. You remember Sadie, right? I mentioned her briefly in the Lake Valley video. And if you recall, I had mentioned that once we got to Hillsboro, I would get into more detail as to how she got around. And when I say Sadie Orchard got around, I mean that in the literal sense. She got around. She was a madam, a lady of the night. And she got her start over in the neighboring town of Kingston, was in Lake Valley for a while, and ended up settling here in Hillsboro. The thing about diving into Sadie's history is that we're gonna find a mix of fiction and fact. Sadie herself told people she was from London, England. In reality, they believed she was actually from Iowa. So when looking at her history, we kind of have to take things with a grain of salt. How much of it's true? How much is story? Eh, you know, we're looking back on somebody who's, who herself liked to tell colorful tales. Born Sarah Jane Creech, Sadie Orchard is believed to have gotten her start in Kingston as a call girl. Later, she supposedly opened a brothel there on Virtue Street. In 1893, she bought her first property in Hillsboro, eventually moving there after Kingston died out. One story in particular about Sadie that stood out to me is that she had supposedly at one time rode her horse bareback, bare naked, down the middle of Main Street. A shrewd businesswoman and respected citizen of Hillsboro, it is said Sadie performed this act on a bet. Now that you know all about Sadie Orchard and her exploits, I should mention she did bring somebody in to help run the restaurant here. His name is Tom Ying. Now Tom ran a very successful business here in the restaurant and I believe he ran it up until his death, which was sometime around the 50s. Actually, it was in 1959 when he passed away. Apparently he ran the business up until the, about the mid 50s, the 1950s. And he happened to live next door over in this house. Now the thing I find most interesting about Tom is that he had been brought here by Sadie to run her business. But at some point, he posted a notice for the town saying that he owned the restaurant, the, the building here, and that it was his business. So I don't know if him and Sadie had this agreement that after some point, she would give the business or the building over to him or what the deal was. Maybe he just decided, you know what? I've been slaving away over this hot stove here, cooking all these dinners for people that it was about time that he took ownership. So who's to say? I just found that rather interesting that he took the bull by the horns, so to speak, and basically called the business his own. 
Now, if you're wondering how it is that Hillsboro managed to survive while Lake Valley didn't, or the neighboring town of Kingston, which we'll probably head there next, hasn't done quite as well as Hillsboro, and that's because here in Hillsboro, they didn't rely just on mining, they expanded into ranching. If you didn't know, Ted Turner's ranch, the latter ranch, isn't too far from here, and from what I understand, quite a few people here today know people or have worked themselves at the Ladder Ranch. And the Ladder Ranch isn't the only ranch around. There are other ranches. If you go north towards Kingston, you can find several up that way. It's just that the people here in Hillsboro were able to evolve and rather than just rely on the mining the gold and silver booms that went on, they were able to find something else to survive, to provide income and a means to continue their town. Not only that, if you look around, you can see that life today in Hillsboro includes places like the Black Range Vineyard, a local winery, which unfortunately gets closed in January. But, you know, if you were to come out here, say, in March, April, May, I'm sure you could enjoy a few libations at the winery. And then next door to that, you got the Trading Post, which offers custom leather work, antiques, it's a consignment shop. And the sign says it's open, so I may just have to go in and see what it's all about. But before I do that, I should probably finish exploring the town. Got this old gearbox here. Or a cable for a mining operation. I like this old mining stuff. Another couple old artifacts here. Some old barrel for pulling something up. And it looks like an old ore cart missing the wheels. Or it's just sunk into the ground. In front of me is an important historical building here the original home to the post office. It's still home to an active post office and in a small way acts as a community center for the people that live here. Our next stop will be the former home of Fred Mister. If you don't know who Fred Mister is, he was the last owner of the last running stagecoach in the entire United States. Here in Hillsboro. Think about that. What are the odds that we would end up in the town where the last running stagecoach was? I don't know about you, but I think that is pretty darn amazing because we didn't plan that. This was just by chance that we discovered Hillsboro. Anyways, we're coming up on Fred's former home here on the left now referred to as the green adobe home, it used to be the color pink. I guess people used to refer to it as the Pepto-Bismol home. Now they can call it the Jolly Green Giant. Or better yet, they could call it the Grasshopper home. And I'm not referring to the insect. If you know what I'm talking about, leave it in the comments. Besides Fred Mister's old home, there are a few other historic adobe homes along the main drag. For example, this adobe home was built sometime in the late 1800s, 1893 perhaps. This one also, I believe, is from that same time period. And not surprisingly, it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Now here's something that brings me back to childhood. Do you all remember what this is from? If only I had five cents on me. Too bad my pockets are empty. Known as the Enchanted Villa Bed and Breakfast, this place was originally built in the late 1930s by Sir Victor Sassoon. He was a Chinese Indian entrepreneur, and get this, he was the first non-British Islander to be knighted. 
I don't know too much about knighthood. I just know that when it happens, it's usually a big deal internationally with the news. I can imagine it must have been a huge honor for him to receive that distinction. Something interesting I found out about modern day Hillsboro from talking with one of the locals is that they don't have any formal centralized government running the town. Instead, basically everything that needs to be done is done by volunteers. There's a real strong sense of community here. Now I know why roads aren't plowed around here at night or on weekends. So that means you really have to be okay with the idea of possibly being snowed in should the occasion arise that they have a huge snowstorm. I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to be snowed in if you had a nice roaring hot fire in a fireplace. Marshmallows, hot cocoa, lots of cozy blankets. I can picture it now. Now this little building over here that's currently housing a cafe has some interesting tales to tell. Well, that's if walls could talk. Built in 1879, this used to be part of a larger building that was destroyed in the 1914 flood. Yes, surprisingly, the town has been hit with several major floods from the nearby Percha Creek. Like many of the other towns we've visited, Hillsboro has also been subjected to floods and fires over the years. In 1904, a fire took out the town's largest hotel and damaged a portion of the commercial district. Ten years later, in 1914, Percha Creek flooded its banks, wiping out much of the rebuilding that took place in this area. But not to digress, I just wanted to point out that this building once housed the bank, the post office, a general store, and Miller Drug Store. Now here's something I haven't seen in a while. Probably, I don't know, 20, 30 years since I've seen one of these. I love the little note that says, it's 75 cents, usually could be more. And here's something else that caught my eye. I like to call them essentials for every dog owner, better known as doggy poo bags. Don't ask me why those caught my eye. Probably because I have a big issue. It's one of my biggest pet peeves are dog owners who don't pick up after their dogs in public. Cause you know, everybody just loves stepping in some nasty old pile of dog poo when they're out about. Enough of that though. Let's take a look at what used to be Cora's Antiques. Formerly known as Sleese Garage. Or is it pronounced Sleazy? It's spelled S-L-E-A-S-E. -E. All I can think of is the jokes that that poor kid must have heard growing up. Not to poke fun at anybody's last name. I, of all people, should know better. I heard plenty of jokes when I was growing up with the last name I had. But just wanted to point out that this building has changed very little over the years. Built sometime before 1893, somehow it was spared of the fire that hit the town and the flooding that has occurred over the years. This over here, by the way, was once the site of the Union Hotel that burned in that fateful fire of 1904. You know what I haven't seen in a while that Marty just loves scoping out? is old air raid sirens. I wonder if they just don't have those around here or what? What are you looking at, Marty? Another air raid siren. My federal. How weird is that? I was just saying how we haven't seen one of those in like forever. Yeah, well, if anybody knows where I can buy one, just let me know. You know what he wants to do with one of these things? He wants to put it in my living room and then use it to scare the crap out of me and the beagle. By the way, this White House on the corner, which is directly across from the old courthouse and jail, was once occupied by Judge Frank W. Parker, who presided over that case I was talking about, the Oliver Lee trial, 
who was tried for the death or murder of Henry Fountain. And I guess in 1912, Judge Parker was appointed to the New Mexico Supreme Court. Despite the loss of mining and being plagued with such calamities as fires, flooding, and the influenza pandemic of 1918, Hillsboro did not fade away like its counterparts. Interestingly enough, at one time Hillsboro had its own power generating station. Originally a coal-fired plant, it was later converted to diesel. Now, as you can see, it's been converted into a private residence. According to one source, at one time, there were over 9,900 mines in the Hillsboro area, mining gold and silver ore. Whether that's true or not, one thing's certain. The mines here produced more than $6 million in gold and silver during their time. If you're wondering how connected Lake Valley was to Hillsboro, this behind me is a prime example of how connected the two towns were. A house built by the former manager of the Bridal Chamber Mine. And look at the view that they had. And the house is pretty imposing sitting up on the hill overlooking the town. If only poor old George W. Lufkin, you know, the guy with the sad story from our last video on Lake Valley, had held out just a little bit longer. This could have been his. But you know how it is with mining. It's like gambling. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Until next time, this is Sightseeing Sally.